I am uh, Rogelio Sainz. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Policy here at UTSA, and it is my pleasure to welcome, uh, welcome you to our beautiful downtown campus for this very important uh, event um, for what will certainly be an informative discussion on the movement of unoccupied Central American children to the Texas-Mexico uh, border. Today we have two excellent uh, panels of scholars and practitioners uh, who will address the roots and causes of the movement of uh, children uh, to the United States, as well as the legal uh, policy, as well as the social responses here in this country. A little bit of background. While this is an issue that has been in the news the last several months, in reality we know that, the, that uh, journalists who often have their ears to the ground on, uh, on uh, uh, trends that are taking place, so social trends, demographic trends, and political trends, had began talking about these, uh, this uh, movement uh, as early as uh, three years ago. Nevertheless, we've seen a significant uh, increase over the last five years. So for example, in Honduras, the uh, number of children um, uh, appearing on the border uh, increased from about 970 to 15,000. Guatemalans about uh, 1,100 to close to 13,000, 13, and El Salvadorans from about 1,200 to, 11, to more than uh, 11,000. Some points to consider as we uh, think about this, uh, this particular issue is that uh, we've seen, for example, younger and younger children being part of this movement, as well as more girls that are involved in, uh, in, in this uh, migration. And in addition, we also need to consider that in a lot of uh, reports we also see uh, this not covered, but in reality the, ro the, the role that the U.S. government has played in this movement. So for example, a long history of uh, the U.S. Uh, having major involvement in the political and economic affairs of the three Central American uh, countries where we see the migration. The U.S. deportations that have taken place and particularly the rising of, uh, of uh, gang activity in Central America associated with a deportation from, uh, from the U.S., and also immigration laws, immigration policies that continue to split families across uh, international borders. And what has been the reaction of Americans? Well, on one hand, you see some people viewing the undocumented children that are coming, coming uh, from Central America kind of seeing them as adventurers, almost out on a lark, kind of a modern day uh, Huckleberry Finn coming and, uh, and making their way uh, to the United States, rather than as vulnerable children who are fleeing violence, many of who run the risk of being killed if they are returned. Then we also see the race narrative that has been well, uh, uh, well timed and uh, throughout the history of uh, American immigration so that we, uh, indeed, we have uh, seen, for example, uh, accusations that these are children that are bringing violence, for example, bringing disease and so forth to this country. Indeed, we have seen frequent uh, occurrences of otherwise good people up in arms about the scourge that uh, unaccompanied children from Central America will bring if they are sheltered in their communities. And we have also seen politicians pontificating about the, uh, about the urgent need to return these children to their countries of origin immediately. Due process of law and irksome nuisance should not get in the, in the way of protecting our nation's 319 million people against child invaders. Uh, what is the future of these children? Uh, the panelists should have uh, insights into what is likely to happen and so forth. Uh, so that um, before I, I turn it over to, to my colleague, uh, Harriet Romo, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, Olivia Lopez, uh, Program Coordinator of uh, UTSA uh, Mexico Center, who has worked tirelessly putting this together. And, and I would also like to acknowledge NowCast uh, and uh, Charlotte Ann Lucas, who is the uh, the uh, 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 now cast managing director, and they've been uh, really a tremendous help for us here at UTSA in publicizing a lot of our events. So we can <laughs> show our appreciation. And thank you also to, to my colleague uh, Harriet Romo, 
who, uh, who spearheaded this, and I'm particularly appreciative that she reached out to the College of Public Policy as well as to other universities as well. So I'll turn it over to, uh, to Harriet. <laughs> Well, we, we welcome you. Uh, tomorrow is the first day of classes. This is a very busy week at UTSA, and this was the only room available, or we would have had more space. <laughs> so it's an exciting time for the campus, and this is an important event to um, make our community aware of and our, our students aware of these issues. I, and we always call on our students to help get our PowerPoints ready. Raquel, you want to come log on? <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> I am the director of the UTSA Mexico Center, and the Mexico Center does a lot of these events in collaboration with other organizations in the community and with our faculty. So we hope that you signed up outside on the, um, at the desk because that will put you on our mailing list so we can get you invited as we do more events uh, throughout the year. Now, when, when all of this happened, I, I re realized, you know, this is not new. My dissertation research was on uh, Mexican undocumented families who had brought children to the United States. And I started thinking of the similarities. And so that's what I'm going to present to you today. Some of the research that I did almost 20 years ago. And uh, the similarities are, are very strong. And I'll point out some of them, and there are distinctions. You know, it's a different time. It's a, it's a different political period. But you'll see a, a lot of things in common. I did my research in a rural community in the state of Mexico, Bejucos. There were only about uh, 6,000 people in that area, many of them in ranchos, in the, the kind of a mountainous areas. Uh, the people who lived on the ranchos had to either walk or, or take a donkey into the little community when they went to the markets. There was no public transportation there. That community had already a long history of migration. Uh, when I did my field work in the community, people knew street names, they knew community names, uh, they were very familiar with various locations throughout the United States where people in that community had gone for a long time. The people there estimated, and the census estimated, that about 30 to 50 percent of the residents in that community were living in the United States at the time when I was doing the research in that community. So you, this is the typical of a rural community that has a, a migration sending pattern. Many of the young people of working age are uh, able to go and make money and send it back are working in the United States. There were no opportunities for jobs for young people in that community. Uh, some of the things that were happening uh, globally, uh, people who were these subsistence farmers were being displaced and they couldn't even make a living and a food for their, their family. So they saw the United States with the wage differentials, tremendous wage differentials. You know, you could make more in one day than you might make in a year in, uh, in that rural community. Uh, so those opportunities were in the United States. Why do these families take risk? It's not that they don't care about their children at all. The major thing is many of these young people are trying to reunite with family members already in the United States. When I was in that community, I saw a family negotiating with a, a coyote who was a respected member of the community. They trusted him to take their son, 14 years old, to the United States so that he could work and send money back, get a stake for making maybe a, a better future for him and his family. Uh, there were lack of schooling opportunities in that community. If you had a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old and you lived in one of those rural ranchos, you're not going to let that child walk three miles to the little two-room school in Bejucos, the city part. Uh, the city was building, or the little community was building a residential dormitory to try to help some of the other children, the older children, come in and spend the night so they could go to school. But if you're a mother, you know, that'd be very hard to send your child to live in another place when they're very young and, and go to school. So they saw the opportunities of coming to the United States, their kids could go to school, they could learn English, uh, they would be together as a family. 
They wanted a better life for their children. This resonated strongly through the interviews with the youth, through the interviews with the parents. And immigration was kind of a rite of passage for those young people who were 14 and 15. For the young men particularly, their uncles had done it, their, fam their fathers had done it, other members of their family had done it. So this was something that you kind of expected to do. It was an adventure. Uh, and in that community, once you were 14 or 15 or 16, you were considered an adult. So it was not like sending a small child to work somewhere. You were expected to work and support your family. Uh, the drug violence was beginning there. The week before I arrived in that community, there had been a shooting, and it was associated with some of the drug, the drug dealers in that area. We were recently in Toluca, which is not too far away from there, and the government workers are afraid to go into Bejucos now because of the drug violence there. So the violence is still there. What happened to those children? Many of them became the dreamers today. Uh, Plyler v. Doe, the case, was working its way through the Supreme Court when I was doing these interviews, and that allowed them to go to school. And the argument was, if you deny an education to children at that age, you are handicapping them for their lives, for their futures. So you cannot deny them the right for an education. So those children, when they came, had a right to go to our public schools from K to 12. Nobody was really thinking what happens after they graduate. So now we have DACA, the Deferred Action for Unaccompanied uh, Minors, which allows them to work, some of these who qualify. But the restrictions are very tight, and not all of the children qualify for that. So there are a number of those children still in the United States, now adults, now 14, well, older, they have their own children who were born here, and uh, they're here, their parents are here without documents in a very nebulous kind of liminal state. There's no route to citizenship or legal residence for them. Their children who were born here are the ones who grew up here, have no knowledge of this community Bihukos. If they had to go back there, there's no opportunity for them there. The violence there, if the government workers won't go back to work there, what about these youth if we send them back there? What's going to happen to them? We've seen a real decrease in migrations from Mexico. So what was going on in Mexico that might have uh, prevented and has decreased some of these migrations? First of all, the government has been investing in education. They are investing in early childhood education. They're investing in rural education, trying to send better qualified teachers there. They're working on the curriculum. They're teaching English now. There's a big initiative throughout the country to teach English in all the public schools so that this will give the children better job opportunities, global job opportunities. They worked on uh, reducing their population. Uh, there are fewer people, uh, young people being born, so there are more opportunities for their, those who are there. The government has been stable for a long period of time, and their economy has been doing well. Their economy has grown faster than the U.S. economy, so uh, that's brought some prosperity, and many of these young people who would have migrated before can now stay in Mexico and get jobs. Um, there's been a lot of effort on economic development, particularly along the border and in some of these rural areas. But they still have not been able to control the violence and the insecurity. So we still see some of these migrations. It has not stopped. The, the, the numbers going back, whether it's voluntary or involuntary, have kind of uh, met the same numbers coming in. So it's kind of a balance right now. But we don't know what's going to happen if the violence increases in some of these communities. If the economic, uh, economics go down, or the, the peso is devalued like it was at one time, which caused a crisis in migration, uh, any of these uh, amounts of migration could uh, occur again. We, of course, have played a part in some of these issues, the United States policies, as Rogelio mentioned. Uh, our increased border security which a lot of people still urge that we need more and more, actually has stopped the return migration that used to be a very important part of the people coming to the United States and then going back. 
The families that I interviewed often came to the United States, stayed a short time, maybe six months, 12 months. Then they'd go back and they had a stake to, one, one man took money back and bought sewing machines. Another one bought a truck so that he could transport goods for other people. So this was an opportunity to come to the United States, get uh, you know, uh, your capital that you couldn't borrow from the bank, you couldn't uh, raise from your family or community. You get a stake and take it back and invest so that you could uh, be profitable in your community. Well, the increased border security has made that very, very difficult and very, very costly. So that's increased the separation time of the parents who left their children to come and work. It's caused the children to want to come and reunite with those family members. And uh, it's caused longer separations and more difficult conflicts for the families. For a long time, our U.S. policy either ignored Latin America or intervened in ways that maybe wasn't uh, best for the economic development of the people who were migrating. And my first teaching job was in Managua, Nicaragua, and I saw some of that uh, up front. Uh, Somoza had been in power for a long time, and you'd drive through the countryside and you'd say, who owns that automobile dealership? Somoza. Who owns that beautiful farm? Samosa. Who owns the, you know, this, this beautiful house right here? Samosa. So what about the people who needed jobs and the people who needed work? Um, that eventually led to uh, an, a revolution or a, a conflict in Nicaragua where change of government occurred. But in the meantime, and Nestor is going to talk about that, there was a lot of conflict and that drove some of those children that I taught who were Nicaraguan to the United States. So this is uh, an issue. This is some of what causes some of the migrations. The US market for narcotics. Uh, Mexico keeps raising this issue. Central America is raising this issue. We are their biggest buyers of narcotics. So if we don't stop that here in the United States, the violence is going to continue. Uh, the drug dealers are going to offer jobs to the young people if they can't get jobs in other viable uh, places. So this is a very difficult situation that needs resolve on both sides of the border. We now have almost 12 million undocumented residents living in the United States and we can't get our Congress to look at the issues and come up with some effective solutions and policies. So what are these young people going to do? If they can't find a viable way of coming and working and maybe getting an economic stake, and people hire them here, there are jobs for them here, there's a need for them here, for many of them, uh, this is going to continue unless we get some kind of policy that will address uh, a lot of these issues. The, look at the dreamers. You know, many of them have done very, very well in, uh, in the United States, but they're not the only ones. Uh, some of the others, I recently was able to recontact one of the families that I work with. She had come with eight children. Every one of those children is working. The majority of them graduated from high school. They are contributing to their communities. We've done uh, a research project interviewing uh, leaders in the DREAM Act movement. They are very committed to giving back to their community, to helping other people, to working in the United States to improve uh, what they see as problems facing Latinos in the United States. There are many dis educational disruptions. We saw it in Nicaragua when the turmoil was going on. Kids were out of school for maybe their whole, uh, from preschool to 12th grade, when they should have been getting an education. That's happening in Central America as well. If you interview some of these youth, and those of you are going to see this wonderful community panel that we have put together, uh, these youth are suffering the trauma of the, the the deportations, the divided families, the, just this migration process themselves, this is going to stay with them for a long time. And it has very many psychological, social, uh, personal implications for the future. Even though we have some wonderful people, and we're going to hear from them, Raices, today, trying to address the legal issues for these children, it's an overwhelming task. 
But as Rogelio said, we can't ignore the legal rights that these young people have in order to solve a crisis. We're a democracy, we're a country that believes in the rule of law, and we really need to try to make sure that we're handling these issues uh, the way that we should and be representative of, of what a democracy, a major power in the, United, in the world, uh, how it should handle migration. Because this is not just a US issue. These issues are occurring globally. Mexico itself is receiving Central American children Central American migrants there. They're trying to figure out what do they do with the children who are uh, returned? What do they do with the families who are deported? What can we do? The reason that we brought this panel together is that we think that if we collaborate, if we address the issues in a rational way, if we try to get uh, researchers like our academics involved to gather the facts, to try to present research that's been done in a systematic way, get the real accurate information out there. The news media tends to play up the, the spectacular, the, the crisis issues. We need to know the facts. We need to know what is really happening uh, with the children, with their families, in the countries of origin. We want our researchers to collaborate with these nonprofits that are serving the youth. Certainly there are ways, and you're gonna hear some examples of the ways that some of our own faculty here at UTSA have worked with these groups, but we can do more of that across our universities in the city. We can try to calm these fears about, uh, you know, ISIS coming across the Mexican border, <laughs> or, uh, you know, that terrorism is rampant among these children. These uh, just create more hostilities, more hate, more fear. And if we get accurate information out and talk about it in a rational way, we can calm those anxieties. And we need to raise an awareness of what the realities are. And these are children. Why are they coming? It's not because their parents don't care about them. It's because their parents care about them so much they want them to have a better life than they had. One of the exciting things that is happening at UTSA to try to help in economic development in some of these countries, particularly in Honduras, uh, they've done it already throughout Mexico, is they're helping universities in those countries start small business development centers. You're not gonna have a Toyota start a big plant in El Salvador. You're not gonna have some of these big companies moving into these small communities. But you will have small businesses, people that hire one or two or five or six or later 10 people in their communities. And so they're trying to develop more of these centers like we have here at UTSA to help these small businesses prosper and develop uh, a capacity to serve and hire more people. Uh, we can provide teachers to the centers that are hosting these youth, or our student volunteers who can come and help uh, so that that education is not completely neglected while they're here, while they're being processed. So it's a complicated issue, and it's not one that any of us have the answer to today. But I feel very strongly by getting the information out, by working together, that we can have some positive solutions. And I'm very pleased to have my colleague Nestor Rodriguez here from UT Austin. He and I actually worked on the same uh, undocumented worker project when both of us were graduate students. So, so we have a long history together and both of us are very committed to these issues. So we're going to have um, a moderator here and she's, she's supposed to keep me on track with time. <laughs> okay, so thank you, and we'll continue with our panel.